to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. In today's episode, we're going to open up the aperture across the ocean to include some of our foreign partners in the projection of air power and the profession of arms. Today, we are bringing you an interview with Major Tim Scheip and Captain Alan Anderson. Major Scheip is an air battle manager with the United States Air Force, and Alan is also an air battle manager for the Norwegian Air Force. Yeah, and what we're going to be talking about today is one of the most important military relationships that we have, and that is NATO. And Colin, this is really hard. I am not good at this. You'll hear my sad stories at the end, but this is really interesting and important stuff, and I'm so glad we're able to bring this interview to the audience today. Yeah, you'll hear through the interview and then in our commentary at the end that working with not just joint, but international coalition partners is a very difficult thing, but that's a good thing we will find. And super excited to share these lessons with all of you in our audience. So let's cut there to Major Tim Scheip and Captain Alan Anderson. Tim and Alan, welcome to the show. Such a great pleasure to have you here. Really appreciate you taking time to spend the next hour or so with me helping me to get much smarter about NATO. Because here's the honest truth. I know that NATO exists, and that's about it, right? Here I am, an officer in the Air Force, and also citizen of the United States of America. And I mean, I think I have a grasp of the overall purpose of it, but certainly the day-to-day -day operations and what y'all are involved with on a day-to-day -day basis, I have no clue about. So it's going to be really great for me personally, but also for the audience of this podcast to learn a little bit more about why NATO exists, what you all are in involved with, and what your personal experience working with NATO has been. So I'm going to leave it there. want to get to know you both just a little bit first. We're going to start with you, Alan, to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, give us a little bit of your background, how you got into the Norwegian Air Force, give us some highlights of your career, and then pitch it over to Tim to do the same. All right. First of all, thanks for having me. I don't know if you had any call it foreigners in the podcast earlier. No, you're our first. That's great. Anyway. You, you managed to infiltrate the Air Force Officer podcast. You're the first foreigner to do so. So congratulations. Thank you. I'm honored. <laughs> so I'm born in 87, 33 years old from third or fourth biggest city in Norway called Trondheim. Okay. Talking of big cities in the States cannot be compared to big cities in Norway because my hometown has, I think, less than 200,000 people. And that's right. third or fourth biggest city in Norway. So it's probably like a village in the States. <laughs> well, after high school, I got into um, the NCO school in Norway. I need to do a quick sidetrack here because the system that we had in Norway earlier was that you had to be a non-commissioned officer before you could apply for the Air Force Academy. Okay. That system has been changed now in the last few years, so it's more comparable to the U.S. system and the other NATO countries system. Interesting. Okay. But anyway, I went through that and was a sergeant for a bit more than a year, and then I applied for the academy, and then I went through the Air Force Academy and did my specialization within fighter control. I don't know what the U.S. term is for all this. AVO, I think. Air battle management. Yeah. And after that, I worked at a CRC, which is a control and reporting center. Is that what you call it in the States as well? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Worked there for a couple of years as both um, what we call an, a fighter allocator and weapons controllers. And by the end of my time at the CRC, I was 
the section head of uh, training and education at the operations squadron. And then I went to work in Geilenkirchen, Germany at the uh, NATO AWAC, where I am today working with uh, Tim. Awesome. Very cool. So about how many years total in the Air Force, the Norwegian Air Force? I started in 2006. Okay. So math in public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> And your current rank is? Captain. Captain. Yep. Okay. Coming up on major anytime soon? So the way it works in Norway, we don't get like the rank at a certain time. We apply for positions. Okay. But I'm eligible to apply for a major's position when I go home this summer. Okay. So in that regard, it's actually more similar to the reserve system here in the Air Force. Cool. Very good. Welcome to you, Alan. Thanks for sharing your background with us. We'll go over now to Tim to introduce himself, and then we'll go from there. Yep. Thanks for having me. So graduated from Purdue University, did the uh, ROTC thing, commissioned in 2007, just at the end of 2007. From there, went to the undergraduate air battle management training, which is at Tyndall Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. From there, went TDY en route through Tinker Air Force Base, which is where the big U.S. AWACS hub is, on my way to Elmendorf, which is now called J-Bear Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson in yep. Anchorage, Alaska. Had a three-year assignment there, deployed once to uh, the CENTCOM region while I was there, and then came back to Tinker did some time as a flight commander, did a stint as the mission planning cell during the time frame that the United States switched from the stabilization ops and finishing up Afghanistan to moving into Inherent Resolve. So I was there when we started Inherent Resolve before it was actually called Inherent Resolve. Yeah. Came back from that, was a flight commander, was a formal training unit instructor. So training the controllers, became an evaluator. Then I went to Korea, Osan Air Force Base in Korea. I was there for a year, evaluator there, got involved in the exercises side of an IG office, the wing inspection team, they call it now. Then from there, I got my choice after doing a short tour of where I wanted to go, and I decided to go to Geilenkirchen and fly on the uh, NATO AWACS. So same sort of thing that I was familiar with in two previous assignments, but now doing it for NATO. That's awesome. And how long have you been there in Germany? About three and a half years. So I'm actually about to leave. January will be my last month here. Oh, okay. And where are you headed next? Back to Tinker Air Force Base. Yay. Yep. <laughs> and do you know what you're going to be doing there at Tinker? So at Tinker, they've just recently started a new process. Before, basically everyone, when they started, got trained as a controller. And then you upgraded to three different options. You could upgrade to senior director, which is basically the supervisor of the controllers, so like Alan was saying, the fighter allocator is the Norwegian and NATO equivalent. Yeah. Or you could go to ECO, Electronic Combat Officer, or ASO, which is Air Surveillance Officer. So ECO was working the passive system, kind of a e-link collection system that the E3 has. And then the Air Surveillance Officer is running the radar, the active sensor, and then doing kind of the ID matrix, identifying air tracks. Now they've changed the uh, training so that everyone will be qualified as an air battle manager. We've got a certification in running the radar, a certification in the passive system, and that allows everyone to stay qualified as a controller. So even though when you upgrade, you upgrade to a new certification, you don't lose your qualification as a controller. Okay. To provide flexibility and kind of overall, they're changing how the career field as a whole is moving. So I'll be probably, they started this, this past year. So I'll be in this kind of initial pipeline of people going through this training. Okay. And it's a little unusual because the training pipeline is usually full of second lieutenants, whereas the people in my class are all majors and the class before me are majors, lieutenant colonels. So it's, right. it's going to be a change. Yeah, for sure. We did an interview with Major Jason Spicer. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he is the ADO down at the FTU for air battle managers. Okay. And he took us through the whole career field, gave us an idea of what it is that you as ABMs do. So it's good to hear from your perspective on the operational side, how some of those things are starting to be implemented and how you refresh those skills, stay current on what it is that you need, what skills you need to have in order to be capable in now shifting toward great power competition and everything that's coming with Russia and China and that kind of thing. Yep. Very cool. Well, good. So our purpose here today is not necessarily to rehash the 
air battle management career field. Although feel free to drop some of that information into our discussion today, because that's obviously your career field and that's what you're familiar with. But also it's, I imagine, very applicable to what we're doing with NATO, with our allies and keeping watch on our adversaries in Russia and China and that sort of thing. And so what I want to do from here is shift into kind of the five W's of NATO, right? And we'll let you lead off here, Tim, with some of the overview for what, where, when, why, who, all of that kind of stuff for NATO. And then, Alan, if you want to uh, fill in some of the gaps after Tim has done some other things that you want to draw out and highlight, uh, we'll do that. So, Tim, take it away. What is NATO and why do we have it? Okay, so... NATO is North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is what uh, NATO actually stands for. And a little side note, if you're from French or Spanish, then it's OTAN is how the acronym is pronounced. Yeah, so it's an anagram. Yeah. So you'll see that on our aircraft and other places. You'll see that it says NATO, and then it'll say OTAN. And people often wonder, like, well, what's with the OTAN? Well, it's because if you're from a Romance language where the adjectives are at the end, right, <laughs> yeah. then... The whole acronym becomes backwards. You want to read it out in French to it? I do not. I do not. <laughs> so, so that's what it stands for. Nobody would understand the French anyway. There are no French speakers listening to this podcast. <laughs> well, to be honest, French is one of the two official languages of NATO, so we should touch it during... Maybe. The... <laughs> yeah. So that's what the acronym stands for. Originally designed as a counter to the Warsaw Pact. So you had the big two power alliances. You had Russia with the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact, which include a lot of Eastern European countries, including uh, Poland and the, the Baltic states. And then you had the United States, Great Britain, France, Western Europe, Norway as well, that all came together to form an alliance. One thing to note that alliances are different than a coalition coalitions are put together on a kind of a temporary basis to affect a certain singular kind of event. Like there's a coalition to defeat ISIS. Yeah. That's different than an alliance, which is a long-term partnership of nations. So that's just one thing to point out. And that's actually a really important thing to understand because NATO is far more enduring than just the temporary partnerships that we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan or in Syria right now, or some of the other smaller engagements that we've been involved with. NATO is by far the more enduring of those different uh, collaborative efforts. Yep, exactly. Yep. 12 nations originally as part of NATO, and that grew over the course of time, saw the fall of the Soviet Union. And then as time has gone on, that NATO alliance has increased to now, as of this year, 30 nations. North Macedonia was the last nation. And it includes many of the countries that were originally Warsaw Pact nations. So mm, that's really interesting. Like Poland. The Baltic states, so Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, some nations are still not NATO nations, but are included in the Partnership for Peace, which are some nations that kind of act as a, maybe a referee between the West and the East as a buffer to say, hey, we're an independent nation. We're not taking sides on either. And they act as a buffer. Finland would be a, a good example of a nation like that. Okay. So that's a brief timeline of events, the who, the what. And so what would you say is the overall mission or purpose of NATO as it exists now? Here it's 2021. It will be when this episode gets aired. But all of the things that you mentioned harken back to Cold War era, Soviet Union, which no longer exists. So why have NATO now today? What is it trying to accomplish today? So I'll say two different aspects. So one would be so the old style is the collective defense of the alliance responding to an Article 5 situation, which is one of the nations has been attacked and the alliance coming together to defend that nation which was attacked. So an attack on one is an attack on all sort of mentality. So that is going back to the old previous kind of Soviet era purpose of the NATO alliance. But that is not the only purpose that the alliance has. As you've seen in Afghanistan, the ISAF mission, that was a NATO-led mission. And so it's not just a defense, but when all the countries agree to take up a mission, a lot of times UN mandates that then NATO takes those mandates and says, okay, well, we will be the action. We will enforce these UN mandates. 
which is something that happened with Afghanistan. Also, in the recent past, there was the only time Article 5 has been actually used was when the United States was attacked on 9-11. And okay. actually, the unit that Alan and I are currently in, the NATO E3 unit, actually came to the United States and flew missions, kind of overwatch missions, in support of the United States after September 11th. Oh, interesting. Very cool. But I think what you're driving at is more of the UN mandates that then NATO takes on. And it could be for regional stabilization in Europe. It could be regional stabilization in Africa. We train for all those different sort of things. Yeah. So you put in there some specifics of the ABM mission, but obviously NATO is far bigger than just flying control and managing the battle space, right? There's so much more going on with NATO. Obviously, the two of you wouldn't be able to speak to all of that. You have a fairly small piece of the NATO puzzle, but it's good to have that broader understanding and recognize that the purpose of NATO is to orient all of these different nations together toward a particular objective or adversary, be it stabilization, be it combat operations, or whatever the objective may be. Yeah, and one other thing I'd like to mention is you may have a nation that has an amazing, maybe special forces unit, yeah. but they don't have the rest of the logistics to get that special forces unit into a conflict where they're needed. But maybe another country in the alliance has you know, maybe a support function. So as a whole, having NATO involved in a conflict or in some type of stabilization endeavor, it allows the smaller countries that wouldn't be able to necessarily get their people into the fight, it gives them a medium to allow their forces to participate. No, that's a really good point, too, that not every nation has every capability, or should they have every capability, but it's the collection of the whole, the integration from all of the different organizations, the different allies, the different nations, that enables us to synergistically present a very powerful force package you know, to deter our enemies or deliver the effects that we need to against them. So we haven't been able to hear from Alan yet on this, why NATO? And it would be really excellent, very helpful to have the perspective from outside of the United States. As a NATO partner, what is your understanding of NATO? Why does it exist? And how important is it to you as an individual, as a citizen of Norway, and as a member of this organization? Yeah, so for me speaking to Americans about this, it's very nice because for Norway through the alliance, the United States is the security guarantor because they have the most powerful military in the world. And Tim touched base on the Article 5 that says um, an attack on one means an attack on all of us and that the other nations are required to aid any member state that is under an attack. For a guy that comes from a small country like Norway, of course, being a part of an organization like that is truly beneficial. Yeah. But if we look at it the other way, how does it benefit the Americans to be in an alliance with Norway? Of course, your intelligence services and your armed forces are interested in what's going on in Russia. Sure. Yep. And the northwestern part of Russia shares border with Norway. So, of course, we know more about what's going on there and we can aid you in intelligence trading and support you when you're flying your reconnaissance jets there and so on. It's a give and take thing within the organization. And of course, Tim and I, we know mostly about the air part of NATO because we're both Air Force officers, but there has been also deals done within the uh, organization where different nations are sending trainers to Iraq to help them build up their national forces. There has been, NATO has had assets that supports the counter piracy operation in the Mediterranean Sea. So I don't know too much about all these different uh, operations, but sure. like you touched base on earlier, it's a vast array of different operations that NATO supports. Yeah, and certainly we as Air Force officers and our audience who are interested in becoming an officer or already are one don't need to know everything about what's happening on the ground or in the maritime mission or anything like that. Again, the most important thing for all of us here is to understand that NATO exists, that it serves to bring together all of these different allies with different capabilities, 
different intelligence networks, different you know operational logistics and support kind of things. Bring that all together again for that synergistic benefit toward a common objective, which may be specific to one nation, but all of them are going to be working together for the benefit of that one nation or something that is going to benefit all of them, right? Yeah, for sure. So I want to pivot here, but before I do that, what else do you think that our audience, prospective officers, those that are already serving need to know about maybe the air mission of NATO and some of the things that you are involved with there in NATO? Yeah, before I come into that, just important that everyone knows that this was founded in the aftermath of World War II and yeah. making an organization like this works as a deterrence as well for other nations uh, because they didn't want that to happen again. But moving into the air part, in Europe, we have different, um, it's called KAOX, Combined Air Operations Centers. Mm -hmm. And there's one in the northern region that's based uh, here in Germany and one in the southern region that's based in Spain. And given to NATO, each of the NATO countries in Europe has given two fighter jets that are on readiness state normally 15 okay. that NATO owns. So the guy sitting at the Combined Air Operations Center shares the recognized air picture through their channels with the different CRCs. And in that way, they can will then order us through NATO, for example, to Norway, order us to scramble two F-16s out of one of our air bases to intercept a Russian aircraft flying along the coast of Norway, of course, within international airspace, but within our air policing area. Yeah. That's the mostly the day-to-day -day basis of how the air policing part in NATO works. Yeah. And we'll get to the day-to-day -day operation stuff here in a little bit, but good to understand big picture, the communication that's happening across the entire European area. But it's not just in Europe, right? NATO exists outside of Europe. Maybe, Tim, do you know of anything that comes over to North American continent, either in the United States and Canada or anything like that? NJET, for example, your NATO joint jet pilot training, where we bring some of the pilots from our NATO allies to the United States for training. We also will bring them into some of our different professional military education type things like squadron officer school, air command and staff college, that kind of thing. So it doesn't necessarily have to be strictly operations because of the NATO organization, there's a lot more collaboration and connection at various different levels from all of these different nations. Some of those things happening actually in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. There's professional education opportunities for NATO members in the United States. NATO participates in like operational exercises, flying exercises like Red Flag, which is the big well-known Air Force exercise that happens four or five times a year. Yeah. Red Flag Alaska, another one, same brand, if you will, but in a different location. Alan, have you been able to participate in any of those? Yeah, I was there in March, actually, when the pandemic broke out. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm glad we had our own jet to fly home to Europe because most of the airliners shut down. Yeah, I'm glad you made it out. <laughs> Though staying here in the United States wouldn't have been that bad, right? No, oh, it would have been great. The per diem is not too bad either. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so Alan was talking about kind of air defense and air policing that we do in Europe as NATO. And one thing I'd like to point out is talking previously about small nations not necessarily always having the resources. The member nations also, they have their own fighter jets and air defense assets that take turns being on loan to NATO they also do this in a way to provide for defense of countries that don't necessarily have an air force big enough to do this on their own, especially countries that are new to the NATO alliance up in the Baltic Sea area of having countries take turns sending aircraft up to those areas to provide air defense and air policing. So it's not always just, oh, we got to watch out for Russia, but maybe what to do in case a civilian aircraft is hijacked calm out situations with civilian aircraft, keeping in mind the 9-11 worst case scenario. And so the NATO countries that have, I want to say spare resources, but have more fighter aircraft that could provide that role of air defense and air policing, they provide those assets to protect the countries that don't necessarily have as much of that particular asset to provide on their own. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really important thing 
to recognize that this is basically one big collaborative project that we're all working on together. Correct. Drawing on resources and talents and knowledge from all of the different countries, bringing it together again to accomplish that common objective, whatever it may be. And using that word, that buzzword of collaboration, I want to pivot there toward General Brown's paper on Accelerate, Change, or Lose. So Reed and I, for this podcast, just spent the last month dissecting this paper and talking about the importance of what General Brown is trying to highlight and what he's trying to help the Air Force to accomplish here in the short term in accelerating the pace of change because a lot of the impediments and issues that he highlighted are all ones that we already knew about. We already knew how difficult it is to collaborate, not just internally in the Air Force, but you know how much harder is that to collaborate with our allies, right? It exponentially gets more difficult when you're dealing with outside of the Air Force network, different languages, different cultures, different styles, and different objectives, that kind of thing. But the recognition of the problem is only the first step. We have to accelerate our pace of change. And so I want to give you the opportunity to talk here about what are some of those internal or external impediments to change within NATO collaboration and working together as a close-knit group of allies, but then also not just talking about what are those issues, what are some of the things that are happening right now? What are some of the changes that are in progress here that are taking place right now or will be in the short term that are working toward achieving General Brown's vision of collaborating more effectively across organizations. And Alan, I'll let you speak to this first. What are some of the issues that you've seen coming from outside of the Air Force and outside of the United States Air Force? What are some of the issues that you've seen? And then you know, what are some of the opportunities or things that you are seeing that are changing for the better? And give us an explanation on some of those different kinds of things. Yeah. So first of all, yes, it's challenging to work with different cultures, different people that speak English, some speak it well, some speak it limited, and put all these guys together. They come from different military systems with different looks on politics, different looks on how military hierarchy should look like. Yeah, It is challenging, but it's also super interesting. Sure. And you learn a lot about yourself and how your cultural awareness is. And for me, that has changed a lot over the years being here because you have your thoughts about how people from that and that nation is and over the time you adapt to it and it's a really really exciting experience to work with a lot of different nations but to answer your question i think the first thing that comes to my mind is the lingual and the uh, cultural differences and nato has implemented nato standardization Agreements, a short version is STANAG, it's called, Yeah, should standardize how we do stuff within the organization. One example is the language proficiency test that you have to take before you go and work where Tim and I are working. Tim doesn't have to do it because it's his mother tongue, but for me that speaks a language that doesn't even look close to English. I have to take this test and it has, um, I think, four levels and we have to be at level three, which is professional, which means that you can sit and discuss. Yeah. You can be on a podcast. Exactly. I feel honored <laughs> to get the level <laughs> three and get to join the podcast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I think the organization saw that language was a big barrier for getting stuff done and uh, adjusted it from a level two plus it was the requirement where Tim and I work earlier up to a level three. The challenge after that is how does each nation at home treat this grading? Do they just call what they call two plus before a three? Or do they actually expect more from their applicants when they're selecting people to go and work at NATO? It got harder for Norwegians because I think they do this well. There's a lot of Norwegians that go through retesting because they don't make it the first time. They have to practice especially their written skills. And I see some nations that are having bigger difficulties in communicating that I know wouldn't have gotten through if they did their tests where I did them. 
Yeah, it's really an interesting thing. So we often talk about in the Air Force, second and third order effects of the decisions that we make. And here we're seeing like a case study in a decision was made about upgrading the proficiency to a requirement to be level three. And then that comes with certain effects from that decision that, like you said, do we actually get what we asked for? Or are the different partner nations going to just pencil whip it and say, yeah, what was a two plus is now a three. And if they do want to actually have it be a three, there are additional effects that come from that too. Additional resources that have to be expended for training people in English. There's a logistics tale to that, the study books, the classrooms, the technology and all those things. All of that comes with additional things that are going to change the way that the different partner nations are able to meet that requirement all for this one thing of what looks very simple, just, oh, well, let's just change it from two plus to three, right? Yeah, absolutely an impediment to change, but something that we hope will accelerate our ability to collaborate and be more effective as partners. Tim, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so I think the pandemic, if there's one thing that's positive that's going to come out of this, it is developing things like Zoom, things like Microsoft Teams, these like commercial VTC capability that everyone started to use. What I've noticed where one of the things that really came out to me immediately when I got to NATO was how much more effective you can be with face-to-face -face meetings. And there are some cultures that an email will suffice or a phone call will suffice. And then there's other cultures that really like, Face-to-face -face is what you need to do if you want to accomplish anything. And so with the pandemic, we're not able to do the face-to-face -face as much. Right. But, you know, the Zoom meetings, the Microsoft Teams, the VTC capability, understanding how to use that, that becoming more commonplace, that can take the place. It's still not as ideal as sitting down to coffee and having a conversation, getting to know the person in a more personal way, and then talking about business or work which is what a lot of cultures, that's their preferred method. But having developing this VTC capability on just a general or higher level war planners that are using VTC or the wing commander or the squadron commander, it's people just to do their daily jobs using VTC to communicate more efficiently with their peers that are at a different location. I think that is a big benefit. I think that is an unintended consequence, but it's really a positive thing that's come yeah. out of the pandemic is that ability and that becoming much more commonplace and people becoming more familiar with these tools that, you know, that we're using right now to do this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And how awesome will it be as we continue to move forward and adjust to this new remote work environment and using tools like Zoom and Teams more frequently and they become more robust and more secure and that kind of thing. I see an opportunity for people like me who are in career fields that very rarely go outside the United States. I'm, I am a civil engineer cross-training into space operations, and there are some space ops stuff outside the United States, but most of it's here for very important security reasons. But opening up the ability for somebody like me to collaborate more frequently with NATO and not having to be there in Geilenkirchen or in Spain or Ramstein or any other large base where NATO has a presence. I look forward to the day when we do collaborate far more effectively, far more frequently with our NATO allies because of the technology that is currently available and the Air Force is moving in the direction of adopting it. Mm -hmm. So what are some other impediments to change or things that are currently taking place that are addressing some of the impediments, some of the opportunities that are afoot within NATO that are going to make our collaboration, working together, our operations within NATO more effective? Overall, I think there's a movement towards being more, the operate more out of forward operating locations, which is, I know, something that in the past was an area that the Air Force was really looking to do. After I left Elmendorf, they put together this concept called Rapid Raptor, which was the idea that you could Get some F-22s, maybe a couple flights of F-22s, C-17s, since C-17s also operate out of Joint Base Elmendorf richardson Bring the maintainers, bring all the equipment, maybe a skiff with you to a forward operating location, fly those F-22s out of maybe a bare base sort of situation. NATO has a lot of opportunity to do that 
sort of concept because you have airfields that are much more forward, but maybe those countries that operate those airfields don't have the money or the resources to have a more aggressive air force. And so having other alliance members come and develop a process to very quickly and efficiently operate out of those airfields, that can be very effective, I think. And I think maybe seeing a little bit of that now in NATO. So I want to highlight that just a little bit because General Brown is a huge supporter of dispersed or untethered operations like Rapid Raptor. He's been writing about that for years. And to hear that NATO is working to implement that is very encouraging because I agree with General Brown that we need to move away from centralized basing and having all of our stuff in one location. We need to be far more agile, far more flexible with our ability to afford deploy and you know, not keep all of our stuff in one location where it could very easily be attacked or become subject to whether that attack is a conventional uh, weapon or nuclear or even like a cyber attack that just shuts down the base because the whole thing loses connectivity and electricity or something like that, right? So the ability to untether from that centralized base forward deploy is going to be excellent. And I would love to see that really have NATO grab hold of that and bring that concept to maturity. Yeah. And so the base we work at, our component is actually, we have a main operating base, and then we have several forward operating bases and forward operating locations. Cool. And so our component already does that concept of, we have a small group of maintenance and logistics personnel at these different bases that are there that keep the base running. And then we bring our air crew and the jet and a small maintenance contingent with us. And then we can operate out of that base basically indefinitely. Like we've brought everything based off of what we already have pre-positioned. We can operate at that base theoretically just like we would out of our main operating base. And so that's one thing that I think NATO is really is the head of the United States in general, the, the alliance is ahead of having interoperability just basing wise and being able to, if some Spanish Eurofighters want to operate out of a, a Dutch base, I think they really wouldn't have much difficulty at all. And they do that. So I think there's a lot of lessons that the United States could gain by looking at how the alliance in Europe specifically does things and how they operate that they could take to other kind of use that in other partner nation situations and coalition situations that's outside of the alliance. Yeah, absolutely. Alan, you want to add anything to that? I saw you shaking your head. Was that in disagreement or was that in, yeah, this is absolutely the direction we're going? No, that was just me dancing to Tim's words here because I totally concur. Um, <laughs> I've been on exercises in different countries while I was working in Norway as well and also with the component. And I think the reason that we do it more than you guys do it in the States is that in order for us to train big scenarios, we can't use our own Air Force because they are so small. So we're more or less forced together to be able to work these huge, complex air missions. And that also works to our benefit when it comes to cooperating, because we need to have computer systems that talk together. We need to have the same standards for what we're going to do in order to conduct the operations both safe and effective. I don't think the United States, in order to launch 50 jets, need to look to to Canada. They can just scramble one small part of whatever they have. No, that's a really good point. I love kind of the picture that you're painting that if you want to exercise and do like big time operations, either in exercise or in reality, you have to rely on these other nations that obviously are going to have that different culture, different language, different way of thinking about things. And that forces the collaboration and standardization. And I think that there is definitely something that the Air Force can learn from you all there, from the NATO organization and our allies there. If we are serious about breaking down a lot of these different silos across career fields and focus more on capability instead of a particular platform, that's the way to do it. Keep things small so that it enables that collaboration and standardization far more effectively than it has been in the past. Yeah, I think with NATO, a lot of times necessity is the mother of invention. So in the US, big military, not a lot of requirement to cooperate necessarily with other people to get a job done. But as we're seeing more and more, anything that the United States is involved in becomes either a NATO alliance 
is involved or there's a coalition. The coalition against ISIL is, I think, like 80 countries at this point. So the idea hits on our communication mediums as well. What kind of computer networks we use has a tendency to overclassify everything just to be safe. And then when it comes time to bring in other nations that we want to participate, we have a hard time declassifying uh, correctly so that we can have our partner nations, a coalition, NATO, join us on a mission. So I think that's another big place where the U.S. can learn some things from how NATO does it. And I think that'll be really key in the future. Whatever the next big engagement is, it's going to be a coalition of some kind. That needs to be thought of ahead of time of how are we going to communicate? What networks are we going to use to get the plan to our partners? And so I know there's work in Afcent on that right now, but that has a lot of room to grow. And I know it's a priority of the leadership there. Yeah, absolutely. Again, we've been aware of a lot of these issues for a long time. And the important thing here is not just the recognition of the problem, but commitment to fixing it and taking ownership of it putting some of those resources, that time, that effort into making things actually change because we can see the vision. We can see the awesomeness of a fully integrated NATO, United States Air Force, and all of the other services as well with all of the other partner nations and their different militaries and working together in a way that is collaborative, that is effective, that is standardized, and that is untethered to one particular base and also one particular way of doing things, right? Untethered operations across the board is going to be awesome. Excellent. There's so much more that we could talk about there, but I want to get more into the daily life of working within NATO. We'll have you go first here, Tim, share a little bit of your experience. You know, how often are you working just in the Air Force environment versus how often are you collaborating with your NATO partners? How many different nations do you get to talk to on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it always just you and Alan sharing a cubicle or is it more frequently that you get to rub shoulders with people from all the other nations? So give us kind of an idea of you know, what the day-to-day -day life is like and we'll go from there. Okay, so... The assignment that Alan and I are at is a little bit different than maybe a typical assignment. For the majority of the time, when NATO does something, you'll have countries that provide a force or provide personnel or maybe two flights of F-16s or something like that to be integrated into an overall mission or package or something like that. But they're all operating from their own locations. Mm -hmm. Our E-3A component is unique in that the component itself is not run by a nation, whereas you have in Spain, maybe you have Eurofighters that when they take off, now they are for a NATO mission. The E3A component is a NATO unit by design. There's no country that is sending us. NATO is the sending country. So it's very unique in that respect. There's only cool. two other units on kind of the Air Force side that are like that. And so it's a NATO air base that operates in Germany, but it is a NATO airbase. So Arlen, how many nations are at the base? Off the top of your head. So there are 17 contributing nations, but there are 15 nations that send people in uniform. The two other nations are Luxembourg that does the registration with the jets and UK. They don't have anyone at the component. They have some at the force headquarters, yeah. which is the umbrella thing for the UK E3s and our E3s. Yeah. So every day I am surrounded by people from almost every country in NATO. My current desk job, I work with another Norwegian, but in our section that Arlen and I are in, we have two Germans, one Spanish officer, an Italian officer, a Polish officer. Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. Dutch, Belgian, Belgian NCO. So it's it runs the gamut. It's awesome. You interact with everyone. Yeah, it's everyone. We've got a Lithuanian officer that's here at the component as well. I interact with him maybe once a week. So it's the full everyone in NATO is there at the base. And that's where kind of team building and being collaborative without necessarily like a very strong rank structure that defines who's in charge 
and with air crew, it's pretty common that it's not necessarily the most highest ranking person is the one who's in charge of a mission. You have a mission commander, you have package commanders, and it's more what their role is in the mission that defines who's in charge. That is even more important in the NATO environment. My commander at our squadron is in the German Air Forces and becomes two chains of command where kind of the administrative chain of command, which I follow through a U.S. commander, and then I have my NATO chain of command, which is a German Air Force officer, and then his boss is an Italian Air Force officer, and then the component commander is American Brigadier General. Yeah, that's cool. It's really completely integrated, and that requires you to use sometimes some creative motivation. It's not just, oh, I outrank you, so you have to do what I say. It's building consensus and building collaboration inside your unit to get a job done. Yeah, absolutely. Really fascinating. The idea of coming into an organization, into a unit, and not being able to rely on a common culture or social biases or just understood way of doing things, but having to actively work with all of the different people there to understand what do they truly care about, having a personal connection with that individual, not necessarily with, not necessarily relying on, hey, you're an Italian, I'm an Italian too, and therefore we get along, right? It doesn't work that way. Alan, you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, people have different political views. I mean, what I look at as a far-right politician in Norway would be far-left in the United States, just to paint that picture for you. Looking down in the Mediterranean, they have totally different views on how things should be run. An Italian officer will meet you in a different way than a Turkish officer will, Mm -hmm. than a Dutch or Norwegian, or for that sake. And after some time, you really learn how to adapt to the different nations. And overall at the component, I think the people that have been there for a couple of years have found this nice flow of how to interact with different nations. And growing as a person, as an officer, I think working at NATO will be good, whatever nation that you're from, because building that cultural awareness that I talked about earlier is going to bring you so many benefits later in life. For sure. The world shrinks. It gets easier to go somewhere after the pandemic, of course, but knowing how to meet different cultures is, I think, really important as an officer and especially when you're part of NATO. Yeah. Having those conversations with people and realizing that we have far more in common with each other than we think we do, even with all of the differences in culture and language and politics and religion and all those different things, if we will just take that moment to actually talk to the person, haltingly at first, right? Because language barriers. Yep. But if we put that effort in and show that we truly want to get to understand that person and care about them as a person, then that is really where the magic is going to happen. It, it's so cool to, to hear that that's kind of like what has to happen yep. on the daily there within your unit. For sure, on the spot. That's so cool. So with that background in mind, I want to hear some highlights from your time there working within NATO. And maybe it doesn't even have to be while you've been in this assignment, but from other times that you've been involved in coalition operations or working with members of different nations, What are some highlights from your time doing that? Alan, we'll start with you. Something that really sticks out in your mind from your time in the Air Force working with partner nations. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, it was a shock to me because I came from my previous assignment in Norway. And after being there for a few years, you're getting pretty good at your job. And then going there and start a flying assignment. I didn't fly in Norway. Going into that training program and really sucking at it in the beginning, you, and you're feeling so small, having a lot of responsibilities in your previous assignment, people were looking up to you. Then coming in there, people speak a different language than you're used to. People behave different than you're used to. I mean, in Norway, I would use first name to everyone that is up to Lieutenant Colonel. I mean, in the US military, it's sir, right? And Or ma'am. Yeah, or ma'am. I I saw some eyebrows that raised sometimes in the beginning when I was approaching people with, hey, Evan, can you help me with this? (laughs) Or, hey, Tim, can you help me? No, I'm just joking, Tim. You were always easy (laughs) going. (laughs) So this was like the initial shock for me. But moving on to highlights, the TDYs, 
going somewhere with this group of people. You're forced to interacting in English. The people that you work with are the guys you're hanging out with on your spare time as well when you're deployed. And uh, being at an FOB, going to the kitchen there with an Italian that makes you the best pasta in the world. Mm. Going uh, to Spain with also a Spanish officer that knows all the nice local places where we get live music by our table at, in the evening, get food that you only can dream of having in your home country. Oh yeah, These things are some of the memories that I really will bring with me uh, when I'm done here this summer. Yeah, uh, And I also want to say something about the personal side. Uh, I'm bringing a wife and a kid down here as well. Okay. Yeah. And after being here for three and a half years now, I have a son that speaks German in addition to Norwegian. And I think that's pretty cool as well. My wife had time to do her master's degree while she was here. So it also brings some benefits to the people at home that we shouldn't forget when we're talking about military officers, because there's always someone sitting at home. Oh, absolutely. I love that you brought that up because we often are so excited about exactly what you were describing, the, the, the opportunity to, to go and see and experience all of these different things as the officer going and doing the operation, right? Going to go you know, TDY and eat all the good food and see all the sites and that kind of thing. But yeah, there's a benefit here to our families at home too, who may come with us on the PCS, you know, the permanent exchanges station to Germany or uh, other locations, and they are going to be different hopefully better for their time spent in that area. So cool that you've got a son now of Norwegian heritage who has this connection to Germany. And there we see that collaboration, that synergy, that bond being formed between NATO nations at the very personal level, not just at the strategic, right? That's really cool to listen to. Thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah, Tim, do you have any add-ons? Yeah. So one of the, he was a German conscript but he was of he was half german half greek he worked for me for about 6 months and his parents met at the component that we work at his uh, father was a greek air force pilot and his mom was german a nato civilian also working at the component and so his parents met there at the component and then his dad you know had to go back to greece and uh, they had their son the Greek military requires the men to do an enlistment, basically. It's not really a very long period of time. I don't remember how long it is exactly. But because he was half German, half Greek, he could choose whether he wanted to enlist in the Greek military or the German military. And so he decided he was going to enlist in the German military and happened to get stationed at the base that his mom and dad met at. I thought that was really amazing. And his grandparents actually still live in the local area. So oh, that's cool. That was really cool. Like an amazing story. And he and I became friends after he had been working with me for a while. I still keep in touch with him after he's gone back to Athens. He's trying to become an airline pilot for Aegean. And it's just such a unique thing. Like his situation specifically, he's half Greek, half German. He speaks both languages fluently. He also, because his father was a pilot, he learned English. And so he speaks, you know, German, Greek, and English all fluently. Awesome. Better than I'll ever speak any other language. The guy has it down. So organizations that bring that sort of help create an individual like that, that is so trilingual, that's really cool. Going along with language, Alan, should I tell the nacho story? <laughs> yeah, you should. Well, if you're going to bring it up, <laughs> okay. I was going to force you to do it if you didn't. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you're familiar with CRM, Crew Resource Management. It's a very common aviation program that they have to talk about how to manage resources and some conflict resolution, some communication, how to yeah. keep your situational awareness, et cetera. We have this program here at The Component as well. I like to tell this story. So while I was a student here at the NATO E3 component, one of my instructors is Spanish. His call sign is Nacho. Great guy. Like one of the hardest workers I know. You give him something, he'll latch on 110% and won't. He'll stay up all night until he is satisfied with how the job's been done. I love this guy. He's awesome. If you don't know many people that are Spanish from Spain, it's very common to have kind of an accent where you don't pronounce the SH sound. So, shh. 
right. like how you would say my name, Shipe. Some people may say it sounds like a lisp. Like they just, it sounds more like just an S instead of an SH. Yeah. And so that day we were controlling some aircraft in an airspace that had a lot of shelves. So areas where the lateral limits of the airspace, the vertical limits don't match the lateral limits exactly. So there's spaces where aircraft will have to either climb or descend to stay inside the airspace. So I'm controlling these aircraft and Nacho is my instructor and he, he looks over at me and says, Hey, watch yourself. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, watch myself. What does he mean? <laughs> and I'm just like, I look at him and just kind of like shake my head. Like, okay, exactly what you shouldn't do. Smile and nod when you don't understand. Not the correct thing to do. Then it's check yourself. And, <laughs> yeah. I go on. I don't take the action he was looking for. So he looks at me again and Tim, watch yourself. And I still have no idea what he's talking about. And now he's starting to get a little bit more urgent. He's like, watch yourself, the self. Finally, because I realized it's very urgent. I recognize the urgency in his voice. Yeah. But I still have no idea what he's talking about. And so finally, I just like, I say to Nacho, Nacho, use a different word. Use a different word. And then he says, the airspace. And then it clicks in my mind. He's talking about the airspace shelf, the shelf in the airspace. And so then uh, we connected, same shared mental model, in our, and then I was able to provide the comm on the radio he wanted to hear to ensure everything was going to be safe. But that is like the stereotypical idea of what can go wrong when there's a language barrier and people don't follow up and make sure they understand what the other person is saying. And that's something that we deal with at a NATO base every day. Every day. And your ability to, as Americans, we have the stereotype that if we don't understand, we just say it louder. That is, that doesn't help. Just saying it louder doesn't help. And so to really have some patience and understanding and your ability to be curious and have patience and to have a shared mental model, get to the point, do whatever it takes to have that shared mental model goes a long way. And it's, it's definitely a skill that you develop and you train and, and it grows as you're here. Yeah. And we can talk about the importance of, you know, being resilient and always working to find an outcome and training for it. But really what I'm hearing is that NATO really makes all that happen. That if you want to survive, if you want to be effective, if you want to accomplish everything that NATO is trying to do, you're forced into that because you have to give up those personal biases. You have to give up a little bit of yourself and try and better understand that person, not just what they're saying, but where they're coming from in order to move everybody together in the same direction. Absolutely. I love everything that's been brought up here in our interview. I really enjoyed all the things that I've learned. And I say, sign me up. <laughs> Send me to NATO. I want to go. Let's do this. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't exactly work that way. But <laughs> I think if given the opportunity, I would love to participate. And I would encourage our audience to do the same, right? To pursue it from the Air Force perspective, trying to get assigned to NATO or any sort of joint or partner collaboration type assignment would be really good for them. And then, you know, if we share this with our foreign audience, as we all of a sudden get tons of downloads from Norway, that's going to be awesome. And they too can pursue this type of thing, whether in the military or otherwise, right? Because you can find opportunities to collaborate with people outside of your culture, outside of your normal way of thinking in lots of different ways. It doesn't have to be within the military. We're just using that as the vehicle for our discussion today. So I think we're going to leave it there, but I do have two more questions for the both of you. First of all, Alan, Tim, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, if they want to ask a little bit more about NATO, about your time as an air battle manager, you know, either going through the Norwegian Air Force or through the ROTC or anything like that, what would be the best way for members of our audience to get in touch with you? Uh, for me, I think via Facebook, and then you can tag me when you post this episode. Great. So we'll link Alan's information and Tim, you as well. We can put your contact information in the show notes. How would you like people to get in touch with you? Yeah, email. Email works. Outstanding. So anybody that wants to reach out to you, they can find your contact information in the show notes for this episode and highly encourage them to do that to get additional information and some of those questions answered. All right. So one more question for the both of you, Tim, we're going to start with you. And then Alan, you'll be able to wrap this up for us. You can listen to what Tim has to say and see if you can do it better, right? <laughs> so Tim, last question for you. What does it mean to be an officer? 
So first off, a duty to your nation and to the principles that your nation adheres to is, is number one. You know, in the oath of office, it's not that you're taking an oath to the president of the United States, it's to the constitution of the United States. So it's to our form of government, not to a specific person or entity like that. So I would say that's the biggest thing is dedication and duty to that oath. Professionalism to overall mission accomplishment to taking care of your people, the people that have been entrusted to you to, to lead them and help them grow. Sometimes the helping them to grow is something that is often forgotten. Providing them opportunities to grow and then providing them the room to fail because people learn the most from their failures rather than when everything goes smoothly. And so budgeting that into your plan that, okay, they may not come through for me or when's the appropriate time to check up on them. So I'd say that's what being an officer means to me. Outstanding. Love it. All right, Alan, over to you. Same question. What does it mean to be an officer? Yeah, I've been lucky to have seniors through my time in the Air Force that's had an open door policy that's been very approachable and that I could hand the problems that I couldn't solve to. And they've listened to me and they've guided me in the right direction. And being a person that you can ask for guidance, ask for help, that you can give complex problems, they don't necessarily know the solution right away, but they can help you with the process and help point out the initial way to go to solve that. And I think in order to become a good officer, you really have to know yourself very well, how you affect other people, how other people portray you when you do some of the actions that you do as a person. I have my negative sides and after going through the academy and working as an officer for years, I've gotten feedback and to be a good officer, you have to know how to use that to your benefit in the future and to be a trustworthy person. And I think it's important to also remember to smile as an officer because when you're meeting someone, uh, even if it's next to the coffee machine in the morning, if you're starting that day with a smile, that can help the other person get a better day. And so look at people in the eye when you're talking to them and also be a yes person. Don't be afraid to say yes. Don't be afraid to take on challenges. And I think all that is what reflects my philosophy of how to be an officer. I love it. So many great nuggets there that we could spend lots and lots of time talking about and look forward to further conversations in the future where we can absolutely do that. Gentlemen, I appreciate both of you taking your time to meet with us today. But more importantly, thank you for taking the time to serve our great nations, serve each other, working to accomplish that mutually beneficial goal of protecting the United States, Norway, all of its allies, and preparing us all for the fight that may come next. Could be great power competition, could be others, but making sure that we are ready for the fight that's going to come tomorrow. Thank you so much to the both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Colin, before we get too much into, you know, real depth on the interview, which was so good and so fantastic, and we're so grateful for Tim and Alan arranging their time for the audience, but I think there's some benefit to having a very quick and very wave top lesson on some international relations theory that would be good to explain the whole idea and premise of NATO. Yeah, I mean, it goes right along with how we like to approach these things, we like to give the foundational background for why we do a lot of the things that we do. Yeah, so take it away, Reed. Awesome. Okay, so forgive me for all you poli-sci majors and experts who've gotten master's degrees in this stuff. This is a very quick and dirty, you know, just to get it done. There are three primary schools of thought in international relations theory, which different adherents to these schools of thought claim explain the majority of the behaviors that we observe from the nations and how they interact. What makes them go to war? What makes them be more willing to be friendly with another nation, et cetera? What is it that makes other nations act the way they do? There are three of these ideas. The first is liberalism. The second is constructivism. And the third is realism. Real quick on liberalism. Liberalism is not 
associated with the United States Democratic Party. We hear that word a lot, like liberal Democrat. This is a different thing. Right. And also, Colin, we are not going to be passing judgment on the rightness or wrongness of these schools of thought. They all have merit. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes it's interesting. You can see in one situation how all of these schools of thought will be instructive into helping you understand what's going on. But yeah. the bottom line is liberalism is the idea that the relationships and shared values that nations have are really powerful, are the most powerful force in dictating nation relations. And what does this look like? This looks like the UN. This looks like the World Health Order. This looks like the World Bank, free trade organizations, etc. And in particular for our discussion today, NATO. The idea being that these organizations and these relationships will spread and increase peace throughout the world. And liberalism has been probably the most significant school of thought that international leaders have relied on in the post-World War II liberal democratic global order that was established. Yeah. So let's talk about the next two. So the second one was constructivism. Constructivism describes the idea that things that humans have constructed being the most important. So we're talking religion. We're talking tribes, ethnicity, race. Those types of shared identities are what drive nation states to action. We could see how this could be very helpful in looking at the Middle East and the recent conflicts that have happened there and how that could very well describe the actions of international leaders in that part of the world. The last one we're going to talk about very quickly is realism. Realism says that it's about power, it's about money, and it's about resources. And I don't care if you have the UN. The nations are going to act in what is their best interest in order to keep their people safe with their power and their money and their resources. Reed, that sounds like nationalism to me. Yeah, there's a lot of relationships associated with that. And if you think about the world prior to World War II, there was a lot of nationalism. Right. You can also see how in a world completely rocked by that just incredibly, just amazing experience that I don't know that you and I can comprehend— how the reaction would be opposite of that, right? which is the liberalism school of thought, hence the establishment of the UN, all these organizations, one of which we're talking about is NATO. So again, we're not saying good and bad about these things. We're going to point out some failures of some of these ideas. One thing that a lot of people are pointing out is there's been a real resurgence in nationalism in the last few years in the Western world, Europe and the United States. And that is because the liberalism ideals have failed some people. Yeah. The idea that free trade is going to rise all boats, everyone's going to get rich, hasn't worked for some nations. And those peoples are getting upset. And not just nations, but individuals within those nations. Exactly. And then it's the collective that ends up resulting in actions that can't be described by a liberalism school of thought. So... Again, this is super wave tops, but it's really helpful when you understand, and Colin, you asked this question in your interview, you're like, why NATO? This really helps us understand this idea that we can't do this by ourselves, and not only that, but we don't want to. Yeah, and understanding that NATO came as a result of the huge rise in nationalism and realism of World War II and the failings that were there, so NATO is a reaction to that, but also that just the idea in general of tying nations together to keep them from going to war is a good idea, as well as combining their resources, their strengths, shoring up weaknesses in order to support each other when they do have to go to war. Exactly. And I think that's a really good intro into your discussion and your interview. I've got a lot of stuff to share. Most of them are sad stories about how I'm not good at this and I'm trying to learn. But Colin, what is it that you really... No, hold on there, Reed. (laughs) What is it that you are saying that you're not good at? You're not good at NATOing? What what do you... Like working with partner nations? Yeah. So, What is it that you are saying... What are you accusing yourself of? I'm not good at cross-cultural competence. Okay. It's a weak area for me. And I've recognized that and tried to confront it. Maybe I'll give you a quick story as a kind of a primer, an example. So okay, I've lived overseas for a number of years. I speak another language. I thought I was pretty good at understanding people from different cultures. 
I'm not. I'm really good at understanding <laughs> Western cultures. We have a very different context of time, of relationships. And when I was at the Kayak in a Middle Eastern country, I'd never been to the Middle East before. It was a whole different ballgame. It was a very different setting than I was used to. And we were right at the precipice of Operation Inherent Resolve, right? ISIS is rolling into Iraq. They're killing lots of people. It's really ugly. And here's the United States Air Force with a bunch of pilots and aircraft flying overhead. And we're capable of bringing the hurt to the enemy right now. Yeah. But we aren't. And it was maddening. I'd have pilots call in on the radios just angry. I can fix this. And we couldn't do anything. Here we are, warriors. The game is ready to go. I mean, the opposite team is on the field. We're ready to go. But nothing was happening. And the reason for that is we were building a coalition. Our Department of State, our president, they were building a coalition. And when that message finally came that we're not going to do anything until we build a coalition of nations to address this as a group, okay, now we know what the delay is, but it was still frustrating. And I remember as the foreign partners started to come to the chaos. They started to establish their headquarters. They started to arrive at meetings. They started to join us and begin planning. It was really, really hard to integrate with these people. And I remember one time in particular, it was Eid, the feast. It's an important Islamic religious tradition. And we had some folks from a Muslim nation. And my boss, he's like, hey, I bought all this food, all these gifts, we're going to give it to them as part of their celebration. And then we're going to start building a relationship. And I'm like, okay, to do what? Like, like, are they going to fly? Are they, like, I'm totally transactional. I'm so Western. <laughs> and I remember going to the meeting and I've got tons of crap to do, right? I'm busy. I'm working 14, 15 hours a day. Like, I don't, I don't got time to sit here and like talk about your sons. Like, I'm just not good at this. <laughs> and I remember First Lieutenant Gann like doing everything I could to not look at my watch. Like I'm almost ready to put my hand in my pocket because I'm just like, I want to see what time it is. And it's hard. It's really hard. But we're not going to do this alone. That's, I think, a really important message we want our audience to internalize. We are not going to go to war alone. This is not something that you can just, like me at the time, decide you're not good at and shelve. And we'll come back to that. I got better. I'm growing. <laughs> but at the time, First Lieutenant Gam, it was a struggle. I was on the struggle bus and it was a hard time. Thank you, Reed, for being vulnerable and willing to share some of your struggles. I want to tell you about uh, First Lieutenant Slade, who was deployed to the same place shortly before you. Yeah. This was in 2013. And at the time, I was working on my master's degree, which is in ethnomusicology, which, Reed, that stands for... I'm trying to keep a lid on it and be professional. <laughs> the music of foreign things, I guess. Close enough. Okay. It's the study of music in the context of culture. Love it. Okay. And so at the time, I was taking a class that required that I learn a non-Western instrument. And I got permission through the powers that be there at the base and through OSI and all that to go off base once a week to learn to play the oud. The oud is a predecessor, a relative to the guitar. I already knew how to play the guitar, but I wanted to learn how to play the oud because it's just a really interesting and fascinating instrument. And as it turned out, one of the people that I was working with, one of the civilians on base, American citizen, but uh, naturalized, originally from the Middle East, he knew how to play the oud and was willing to teach me. And got everything set up so that I could go to his house on a weekly basis, learn to play the oud. And we actually put on a concert at the end of my time there for members of my squadron, his family, and it was lots of fun. I played the oud, he played the bass. I actually had another lieutenant who came with us and played the drums. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. But please tell me PA was there and there's pictures and proof, please. PA was not there. Oh, Okay. But there is a video somewhere. I'll have to dig it up yes, and see if please. Uh, I, would love I to can see share it. it. I would love to see it. Anyway, so why do I share all this? Well, one, it was just something that I was interested in. I've always had 
an interest in world cultures and different ways of viewing the world and thinking about what's going on and using the arts as a way to study that music, dance, food, those kinds of things. But this actually ended up helping me and the Air Force to get some pretty significant work done because this civilian who was teaching me the Oud was responsible for negotiating with the host nation on behalf of the United States there on the base. And in my role as a civil engineer responsible for a lot of very large, very expensive construction projects that all required host nation approval to get done, the relationship that I developed and fostered with the civilian led to even greater and deeper relationships with the host nation because of it. Now, I didn't set out to accomplish the Air Force mission by way of learning to play the Oud, but it was nice that that worked out. And I'm not saying that everybody who is listening to this should go and seek out those kinds of opportunities, but we can see how having that ability to speak cross-culturally can be a valuable strength, a valuable tool to you as you move up in levels of influence and authority and rank and position within Air Force, within the DOD and within the coalition. Because let's think back to what this is really all about. Why do we care about this? Yes, just understanding NATO is an important part of what we're discussing here. But think back to our conversation around what is the ultimate purpose of being an officer? It's to take command and take command at what level? The joint force coalition type level. And these types of experiences, going to work for NATO on a NATO base, going to different schools, traveling the world, these types of things are going to help you develop to speak and connect cross-culturally in that joint and coalition environment. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a lot smaller Air Force than you think it is, the global Air Force. Yeah. That was something that Tim mentioned a few times in the interview, that he ran into people that he had worked with, and they were able to instantly have that connection and get some work done. I remember when 2nd Lieutenant Gann took a class at the DIA right after my commission, and there was an Italian Air Force officer, fast forward three, four years, were deployed at the CAOC at the same time. And we have that instant connection and able to collaborate. Our roles overlap significantly. And so we work together quite often. Yeah. And it was really easy to just start right off with that relationship. We had shared dinner. We had broken bread together. That kind of thing really matters. And Colin, I, I want to give myself a little bit of credit. I have been getting better. So the audience may remember that in the summer and fall of 2019, I was deployed to the UK where I was working for a UK organization. So I was like the one token American. There was a few of us, but not a whole lot embedded with a UK element. They're part of the Five Eyes, but they're also one of our NATO allies. And we talk a lot on this podcast about how important it is to know yourself and to grow. What a better way, like Tim also described, to learn more about yourself yeah. than to be embedded in and learning a different culture with other people. Now, these Brits, right? I mean, they're our grandparents, essentially, right? They birthed our <laughs> nation. But I still learned a ton. I learned to appreciate my service. I learned to appreciate the history of my country and of theirs and of our shared interests. I learned a ton about myself. And we talk about how important that is. What a better way to do it than through the lens of someone else. Yeah, and it's not just we Air Force officers going over there, wherever over there is, to gain those experiences. We open up the opportunity for NATO partners to come to the United States. Little teaser here, our next episode coming up next week is going to be about NJET, and we'll see that play out there in more detail. But also think about what Alan was saying, taking his family from Norway to Germany and now he's got a son who has this perspective of a different nation, speaks German, but it is Norwegian. And how that then obviously it accomplishes one of those liberalist goals that you mentioned earlier of tying nations together. Mm -hmm. But you can see how when we interact, when we work together, either in an operational or just in a social context, 
we gain that understanding that is going to help us and the Air Force and the Air Forces, or the global Air Force, as you put it, to be really successful into the future. Yeah. You know, something that I found, airmen are airmen are airmen. Yeah. It is a really neat thing. And Colin, I know you've experienced that as well. There is something about people who take to the sky and are members of the profession of arms that binds us together. And those have been really rewarding experiences to see somebody in a flight suit that just looks weird. The French, have you ever seen yeah. a French flight suit? They're, they're bizarre. But the thing is. <laughs> or their wings on their badge that yeah, just yeah, look completely different. But you know but what? you still recognize it. Yeah. And you know what nation was one of the first to show up in OIR when we needed people and planes and bodies? You're going to say the French. The French. Yeah. I will go to war with those guys any day. Go to war with like, them. Have them on, on our, our side. side. Yeah. Yeah. Let's clarify that. Yes. <laughs> yes. International crisis averted. I would team up with them and be on their side any day. And they're warriors. Absolute warriors. They're professionals. They're really good at what they do. And they can be a lot of fun. And I've learned so much. And so having Tim and having Alan come on and share their experience and perspective, I really hope it's opened the eyes of our audience. And yeah. if you ever have an opportunity to do an international exercise or to deploy or serve in one of these organizations, I would highly recommend you strongly consider that. Yeah, It's been incredibly valuable. We are never, ever going to fight by ourselves. That is never going to happen. And the more we can be equipped to appropriately interact with our peers and brothers and sisters in arms from across the globe, the better we are going to be at doing our job and accomplishing the mission. And that's the bottom line. I'm so grateful to Tim and Alan for taking the time to share their experience, talk exactly along those lines with us, and show that this is not just the United States Air Force Officer Podcast, but this is the Air Force, the Global Air Force Officer Podcast, and that we share that common thread across all the Air Forces. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for spending your time with us and allowing us to have this discussion Awesome. Anything else before we wrap up this week, Colin? Just stay tuned because we're going to continue to explore NATO next week as we discuss NGEPT and want to make sure that everybody is there for that. Awesome. Looking forward to it. And with that, that concludes this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.